Hello, and thank you all for joining our panel today. For those of you who are tracking, this is our third year hosting a panel with the end users of our medical and diagnostic technologies. You will recall that in year one, we spoke about the patient voice in clinical development and innovation. Last year, we focused on the effectiveness of patient communication and education. Given that the pandemic has led to an accelerated shift to telemedicine, remote monitoring, and other digital technologies, we decided to focus on all things digital this year. But before we get started, I wanted to thank the Medical Device Innovation Consortium, or MDIC, for hosting this event. I can't overstate the importance of MDIC's mission of advancing medical device regulatory science for patient benefit. As a public-private forum that convenes regulators, industry, and patient organizations to promote public health through science and technology, we are always working to improve patient safety. I'm personally proud to have been on the board of directors of MDIC since 2017 and a member of the executive committee since 2018. Last year, I was honored to be elected board chair, a position which I formally begin this month. I want to take a moment to recognize the work of MDIC and thank my colleagues for trusting me with this leadership position. In my day job, I'm the leader of Johnson & Johnson's Office of the Chief Medical Officer for Medical Devices and Global External Innovation. My team is responsible for overseeing patient monitoring and safety surveillance practices across the company's many medical device products, as well as our global external innovation team. Keeping patients and consumers as safe as possible is why my colleagues and I go to work every day. So why is patient safety so important? It may seem obvious that it's inherently good to keep patients free from avoidable harm when they interact with the healthcare system. But take the question a bit deeper and it gets more complex. For example, how do we ensure people stay safe when they use or experience a brand new product, device, or technology? Innovation in the healthcare industry is ongoing, and we constantly seek new ways to treat and prevent disease with benefits for consumers and society. This became even clearer through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic, which sped the shift to digital medicine in many ways. As these fundamental shifts continue, it is important to make sure these innovations do not come at the cost of patient safety. This calls for constant evaluation of intended benefits and potential risks throughout the development life cycle and also after products are on the market. As the pace of innovation increases in the age of digital technology, our responsibility to patient safety is more important than ever before. To help answer some of these questions, I'm excited to be joined by this group of people today. Please join me in welcoming Heidi, Brian, Stephen, and Cherise. These panelists will share their thoughts on digital solutions and what these technologies mean for patient outcomes and patient safety. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear what they have to say. So Cherise, let's start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Cherie Shockley. I, I was diagnosed with latent autoimmune diabetes in adults back in 2004. I um, use CGM technology and also insulin pump technology to help me manage my diabetes. And as Jiju said, my day job, I am the community manager for the Diatribe Foundation. And also uh, when I'm not working, I participate in the diabetes online space, hosting weekly Twitter chats, and also engaging with women of color who live with diabetes. Thank you, Sharice. Brian? Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Walsh. I am a IT director by day. Uh, and in 2009, I became a heart patient as a result of ventricle tachycardia and sudden cardiac arrest. Um, I received an ICD implant. Um, and then three years later, actually was diagnosed with mitral regurgitation, 
um, and had a mitral valve repair done later that in 2012. Uh, since then, I've continued to be an athlete, um, triathlons, half marathons, weightlifting, whatever it means. Um, and I continue to advocate for patients and helping them to promote that healthy lifestyle and continue to live that life that they desire. Thanks, Brian. Heidi? Hello, everyone. My name is Heidi Dose, and I have been engaging with, with healthcare from a ver very, very early age. And I've had to experience having um, spinal implants, uh, orthopedic surgeries, uh, robotic surgeries for kidney rebuilds and cardiac implants. So the, the journey of cross surgery information and how I use wearables to be able to get back to an athletic lifestyle is something that I try and communicate back to patients through Tour to Heart, which is a nonprofit uh, patient advocacy organization. Thanks, Heidi. And Stephen. Thank you, Gigi. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Makita. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. My day job recently ended after 39 years as an assistant attorney general for the state of Utah. I'm now devoting myself full time to my main passion, and that is patient advocacy. I am the rich and ongoing beneficiary of many medical devices. My first introduction to the hope and promise of, of medical devices was a little over 50 years ago when I received the Harrington Rod to help me save and extend my life. I had severe scoliosis. My spine was in the shape of an S. Each morning after that surgery, I was given about two or three minutes to express and communicate my desires and frustrations to an army of physicians and residents. And there, I not only found the value of medical devices, but I also found my voice and the critical importance of the exchange of information to not only receive data, but also to report my outcomes. Thank you very much. Again, thanks so much, Cherise, Brian, Heidi, and Stephen for joining this conversation. I'm eagerly looking forward to it. So maybe Cherise, we'll, we'll get started with you. Um, over the past year, through the pandemic, I think you would agree with me when I say that the disparities in healthcare delivery have just become so much more obvious. So maybe let's start out there. Uh, how do you feel digital health tools can improve healthcare for the underserved and diverse communities? Oh, that is a loaded question. And the reason why I say it's loaded is I think first we have to back up a little bit and really think about making sure that people of color and people who are in underserved and under-resourced communities know that this technology exists. Uh, for instance, I, I have an insulin pump and I also have a continuous glucose monitor. Luckily, I've been very blessed because my husband served 24 years in the military. So we've been able to have great insurance. But there's a lot of people who look like me that do not know that the technology exists or they're told that are under the assumption that they can't afford it. So healthcare providers don't even talk about it. So I think that the first issue is making people aware that the technology exists. A second issue is accessibility. I mean, once again, it goes back to making sure that they're aware. People don't even know that they have access to this technology. And then affordability. It doesn't make sense for people, I mean, there's 34 million people in the United States living with diabetes. And out of that, over 6 million are using insulin and they still don't. So the type one population has greater access to technology than those with type two diabetes on insulin. So I think that's a huge hurdle and a huge disservice to the community being that a lot of people with type two diabetes are, major, are minorities. So that's another issue. Um, so 
I could keep going because this is a very hot topic for me, but I just think we need to make sure that people are aware, have access, can afford it, and the underserved and under-resourced communities and take all the assumption away. Treat the person first and treat treat the condition second. I mean, if we just did that, healthcare would be much better. Could not have said it any any better. Um, I don't know, Stephen, maybe I'll call on, on you, just given the, the public service, the life of public service that, that you've had, any experiences you'd like to add to that in terms of technology and, and its use for, for underserved populations? I appreciate that and I echo what uh, Cherise so eloquently stated. And the bottom line is not one size fits all. Uh, we have to tailor our communications, our outreach, and our engagement to individuals and not apply a template to those. We have to be informed as to who our audience is, what their needs are, and we must reach out to community leaders throughout these populations to, again, establish a bridge you know, um, communication in this day and age can both be a bridge or it can be a barrier. To maintain the bridge, you need authentic, intentional engagement with individuals who are trusted and loyal and known by the population you are engaging with. So you can't come in not knowing your uh, audience. You must do research. You must have your teams, your staff trained in the culture and the unique needs of your um, audience. So we have to be ever cognizant of the barriers that we have to respect the digital divide and be very, very innovative and flexible in the ways that we communicate and dialogue and have authentic conversations, not one-way lectures. Thank you very much. Well, thanks thanks for that, Stephen. And it's not just understanding the audience, right, Cherise? It's also got to do with unintentional biases or hidden biases that, that exist. I, I wonder, I'm sorry to come back to you kind of back and forth like that, but I wonder if you have some experiences or some suggestions to our audience in terms of how we might be able to address and overcome some of those. So I think it goes back to, right? Don't, if you see me walk in a room, don't assume because I am a black woman that I don't understand or that I don't want to understand my condition uh, that I have. So I think it's it's really simple, right? It's almost like sitting and building a relationship. And I say this all the time is that healthcare providers and people that make these devices, you're our lifelong friend. So treat it as if you're treating a friendship. Talk to me and get to know my needs because you would be surprised to know that I am just as engaged with my health care as Heidi, who was a white woman, and Brian, who was a white man, and Stephen. I am just as engaged, but you have to give me the opportunity by getting to know me first and then treating my condition second. I mean, it's just the rule, right? Treat people, treat people how you want to be treated. What if the shoe was on the other foot and you were that person with diabetes? And I assumed based off of your your culture that you don't want to be bothered with any of the technology or you're not smart enough or you can't afford based on what I see. So it's just erase it and just get to know who we are. And I think to me, that's the simplest thing that anyone in this industry could, could do. And also make sure you invite us to the table. Don't have a room full of white people, white males at the table. Invite people of color, get uncomfortable, get out there and ask people questions. If you don't know, there's some leader in the community, especially with social media, that's giving you an opportunity to look at the world, to be able to point out people who you could reach out to. So it's, it's simple, it's easy, it's not rocket scientists. Would Go ahead. 
Oh, I just, you know, to echo what Sharice is saying, I wish every conversation with my provider started with what are your goals and what's important to you? In the 50 some years that I've been treated by healthcare, no one's ever started a conversation like that. Well, I mean, if I can chime in, I've had one experience with a doctor who literally walked in and he wanted to know about my family. He wanted to know where I came from. He, when he did my surgery on my heart, he said, I want to make sure that I tell my team, here's who this person is beyond just the device we're putting in or the surgery we're doing. And I think as I look at the team that this is going out to, as for the, the admin, the people that are making the devices, the people that are going in there, think about who your typical patients are and make those devices specific, not so much to the patients, but thinking about the full broad spectrum, because not everybody has the same capabilities as, as the other person. Not everyone has a computer sitting at home or things of this nature, or even a smartphone to go and look at the devices, look at the information, but think about the broad spectrum of patients you're covering. So, so maybe I'm gonna follow up with there, Brian, with a, with a different question. What information and digital health solutions um, do you feel would be helpful um, or useful in moving forward to manage care? For me, as a someone that takes real strong engagement in my health, um, I want to read everything I want to know about it. Before I go in for a surgery, I want to know what I'm dealing with, what to expect when I get on the other side, what's going on. Um, and I have this device implanted in me that literally checks my heart all day long, monitors me, watches over me, but I only get to see the data from it every six months when I go to see my doctor. I have to go in there and ask to see the data. And he's going to ask me, what are you doing at 530 in the morning? Well, that's when I work out. What are you doing at this time of night? That's when I do this. At the end of the day, the data is all there. When I went through and I and I got the implant, I was nervous about getting back into my athletic capabilities. And to the point where when someone asked me to start running, I was concerned about starting to run because I was afraid that would push my heart rate too high. And so after getting through some of the fear that goes along with it, and when you talk to other patients that have a defibrillator implant like I do, they're scared to get out and run or do anything because of the fact that they're afraid of getting shot. I wasn't afraid, I just wanted to know. And then eventually I started wearing the chest strap monitor and eased into it. And eventually got to the point where I didn't even wear that anymore. But it was knowing where my heart was at throughout. And in 2012, I ran my first half marathon with the device implant, not worried too much about it. And then in May, I was diagnosed with mitral regurgitation and didn't realize that my doctor said, continue doing what you're doing, keep going ahead, just take it easy a little bit. Well, I continued to push myself in November, I got the first shot from my defibrillator. Had I known that my heart rate was escalating to the point, my running to the point where the regurgitation was getting so bad, I might have throttled back sooner. But it took that six month window, or at that time it was three months before I could actually see any data or know where it was at. I just want more access to my data. I want more access to the information. And I know there's concerns over privacy and security and such, but whatever we can do to help encourage the patients, the patients to know what they have and give them access to the data that's for the devices that are in them. So, so maybe just to follow up again, up there, Brian. So when we say access to data, being a technologist yourself, you recognize there's a lot out there, right? How do we filter? How do we determine what is meaningful to you or should we be the ones determining or who should determine that? And in, in my opinion, I should be able to determine it. Um, just like when I go in and I do something on my house, I get to know what's going on in my house and I make the decision what's gonna happen to it, what decisions are gonna be made. Just give me access to the data if you wanna put insights or highlights into there, that's fantastic to show, hey, we see that you're getting to this level of heart rate, or maybe for Sharice, your, your diabetes was here. Yeah, I'm sure you can have access to like my fitness pal, things of that, where you can monitor your diet associated with it. You can start to read some stuff into that. And if I'm a knowledgeable patient, just give me the data. If you let me provide the questions, I wanna question my doctors on why they're doing certain things. Why is my heart rate, my max heart rate when I was shocked was set at 180? Well, for an athlete in my 30s at the time, for my max heart rate to be at that high wasn't a big deal. So there was it was a reasonable shock when I got shocked. They said, oh, that was an inappropriate shock is what they called it. But for me, it hurt like the Dickens. So I don't want to have it happen again. So it's just give me the data so I can get an assessment of where I'm at. 
and then let me come back to you and ask the questions and then let you educate me on what that data is showing. Okay. Brian, Brian Go ahead. Uh, hits the nail on the head. Uh, the, um, the key here is not to just give three or four items on the menu. We have to have, uh, we get to select what we deem to be a return of value and a return of results. The, um, so we are the ones who uh, state our preferences. We need access to full data. Information is key, but uh, we're not automatons or um, people who want the same things. People have to meet us where we are and to trust us and to understand these aren't your devices. These become our devices and they propel us on with all of our um, aspirations and frustrations. They become part of us and everyone needs to respect our desires and also respect the apprehensions and fears that we have. Every day I asked my office assistant for 10 months, am I going to be dead of COVID? That was very real for me. I've been saved twice by ventilators, but it's a horrifying and terrifying experience for me not to be able to speak and express my desires and to have people surrounding me and only depending on my eye blinking once for yes or blinking twice for no. It was the worst experience of my life and thankfully I got through the pandemic without one, but it was still I knew that those ventilators had great value. They saved so many people's lives. And so I think that you should all know that we as patients really appreciate and are so grateful for our devices. We just need information to um, help us plan our lives, not only throughout the years, but just to get to one more day. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to actually go back. I'm sorry to, to cut in. Brian, I will tell you that I am sitting here listening to you talk about your diagnosis and the stories that you went through. And it's so similar to what people with diabetes go through, right? It's give us our data, which now we have continuous glucose monitors, which is phenomenal. And we can see on day to day to help us focus on our time and range versus having a three month test to say, this is what's happening. Um, another thing I would like to add to that is we have access to all this technology. Um, so we're very fortunate, but I want everyone out there in the audience to think about those who do not have access or those who have access and can afford it and just don't want to. So how can you create technologies that could help people be as engaged with their health care as those with. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks. Thanks so much for that perspective, Sharice. Switching gears slightly, Heidi. Um, so, so we've talked about access to data. We're talking about the devices in the real world. Let's go to the discovery and the innovation side of things. Um, just based on your experiences, how can digital health and telemedicine improve patient engagement in clinical trials? So patient engagement in, in clinical trials, um, you know, right now, when you think about a, a study being designed, and in the past, a clinical trial is typically designed with a, a group of healthcare industry stakeholders, you, you know, thinking about what it is they want to study, what is that study design going to be? What is the cohort they're going to go off after? And then onboarding them. And in, in the past, it's always been done without a lot of the, the participant engagement. And then there's this frustration with 
researchers thinking, well, how do we get more people to participate? No one wants to, you know, be in our study. And sometimes it's because the study isn't that relevant to someone like myself or, or a patient group saying, wow, that's something that's of interest. I'd like to be a part of it. And it feels more like it's a group of industry people that want to pull something out of me or out of us as patients versus now with telemedicine and digital health, the ability to impact clinical trials from the beginning, being a part of the concept um, and having a seat at the table to design the study so that it, it starts to put a patient spin or perspective to then collect information that's useful to the clinicians, but also useful for patient communities. And then if you can engage in the ongoing study using telemedicine, being able to virtually submit uh, your updates, whether it's the patient perspective or it's data that's collected from a remote monitor or wearable or something like that. But telemedicine digital health allows for study participants to provide much more information gathered in the context of living their lives, not just collected in the sanitary environment of the clinical, um, you know, going into the clinic. So I think it's also more useful in a real world sort of way also. So I, I feel like we'll be able to design better studies, have more engagement, and a willingness of patient stakeholders to be at the table through the entire process. And Heidi, I would like to add to you, I'm, I, sorry, I hate to be the person that keep adding this on. Like, <laughs> clinical trials are only as good, like this is 2021. We should have more people of color mm -hmm. from different walks of life participating in clinical trials and I don't know about y'all. I don't know. I've always wanted to participate in a clinical trial, but they're not close to me. And then when you think about the underserved and under-resourced communities, they're not even on both lines. So they can't get on the bus to go participate in a clinical trial. So when we are thinking about these clinical trials and we think about telemedicine and telehealth and being able to bring some sort of uh, programs and trials to people digitally, make sure that you just don't have privileged white people participating in these clinical trials. Well, let's talk about the COVID vaccine. I was very hesitant when it came to the COVID vaccine for several different reasons, Tuskegee Airmen experiment, Harry Ann Lacks, but what changed my mind really quickly, one is because of community, secondly, because I have diabetes, but most importantly, I was able to read clinical trials to see how they affected people of color and people with comorbidities. Like that information needs to be made public. It shouldn't be held back because it's it, it motivated me even more to say, okay, well, if there are black and brown people who took this vaccine and a lot of these people had some type of medical condition and they seem to be doing perfectly fine. That's the stuff we want to hear. We need to trust the system that has failed us for so many years and being as open and honest with people of color and underserved and under-resourced communities is once again, something that needs to happen to make sure we have diverse representation in clinical trials. Yeah. Well, and I I live in rural Idaho, so you know, when you look at under under resourced communities, um, you know I am about two hours from a cardiologist, um, two hours from you know an airport that will get me to my um, kidney physicians in Colorado, and then my um, cardiologist at Mayo Clinic. It's it becomes very difficult to engage with with healthcare unless uh, you know telemedicine has actually made it really so much easier. You know the 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 silver lining during COVID for me personally is I can have much better, more often conversations with my providers, and I'm involved with the design of clinical trials that we're now doing through PCORI, and uh, I'm I'm on a advisory board with the uh, Mass General. 
And we all get on Zoom calls and we're designing studies and we're thinking about how do we roll these out and engage um, you know, patient populations because we're not limited by that physical structure anymore. And so I'm actually feeling much better about my personal health care and my health care and the opportunities to engage with other patients um, in this new world of, of digital health. At, at, at this point in age, with the stuff we've lived through through the last year, there's no reason for doctors and providers to not be more comfortable with the virtual environment, getting data in different ways. Um, there are quality wearables out there from Garmin to Aura to different things that are providing real data uh, for like Aura in particular with the football and basketball teams that they're working with real data on what's going on to be able to be comfortable with the data reads that they're getting off that gets beyond just that face-to-face -face meeting and my my device sends data on a weekly basis up to my physician there's no reason for me to have to go into a hospital just to say yep everything looks good get used to looking at a camera get used to checking things out and figure out ways around that so we can serve the broader populations and provide healthcare in a more low cost to effective way than what we're doing it today because if we want to reach those broader communities We've got to figure out how to do it more cost effectively as well. Yeah. And I just want to add, oh, I was just going to add really quickly that in the telemedicine conversations with my physician, all of a sudden we're on equal footing. I'm not in a hospital gown with the, you know, the, the, the doctor talking sort of down to me, but instead we're both having, we're working as co-collaborators on, you know, healthcare solutions. I get to have all my clothes on and we get to look at each other on the same level. And I think that's really changed the conversation. And again, you know, like Brian, I use my wearables. Um, I'm kind of running out of body real estate now because that's the the day-to-day -day insights that allow me to, to go from, you know, being a patient of many, many different types of, of surgeries and, and implants to crossing the, the finish line at Ironman. So, you know, that's what gives me the, the real-time data. Uh, um, also, uh, with regard to clinical trials, uh, we need to be very sensitive to the fact that when we go into populations who've been underserved, neglected, traumatized, and subject to travesty and tragedies, we need to understand and we need to listen and we need to stay in those communities. We need to show those communities we are not only invested for our own unique idiosyncratic research. We're there to stay. We want to make a contribution and that we are invested and we need to compensate compensate individuals for their research time we need to be flexible and innovative in understanding that not everyone likes or trusts telemedicine they need trusted community leaders in those areas we must be very honest with ourselves this goes back to your point Chijo, about bias. We must be sure that our exclusivity, our exclusivity criteria are not built around suppositions, assumptions, and presumptions that aren't true. The only way that we really change the paradigm in this country of clinical trials is to, reinforce, first of all, uh, gather data from everyone who is going to be impacted and that we return results and information to them so that they can make um, a difference. So we really need to seize the moment, not just um, cling on to cliches such as transparency, privacy, uh, security, but we need to understand that these are people who need and deserve
the kind of respect and productivity in, the, in these applications of these devices that have made differences in all of our lives on this panel. This is a cross section, but we are, to, you know, to a most extent, as Cherise said, privileged, and we need to do a better job and be honest with ourselves that we failed that po those populations. And we must change. We must change forever, not just for a couple of weeks after this conference. Thank you. And Steve, just to piggyback on you really quick, um, and, and Heidi, telemedicine and telehealth has been like, I've heard people say they haven't missed an appointment. I've heard people say that, you know, even healthcare providers are like, I can actually go and have my, my patient have me, you know, show me what's in the refrigerator. Like I can't, couldn't do that before. And it's allow healthcare providers to actually look at the people's environments behind them and meet them where they are. So instead of focusing on diabetes, it's, are you getting the medication that you need? Do you have access to, you know, your CGM supplies or your pump supplies? So I think that for it to even be on the chopping block potentially after COVID is over, you're doing another disservice once again to people of color and people in underserved and under-resourced communities. That should not be an option. It should be okay, this has worked. We have proof that it's worked over the past year and we need to figure out how to continue once COVID-19, it's not going anywhere, but once it, it, it calms down, I mean, we have to. And I urge you all, if you have any control over it, to make sure that this doesn't go away. We need this. Thanks so much for that, Cherie. So, so a comment and, and a question back to you. A comment is, this is your panel, so none of this will be edited. It, the reason why we host this is to hear from you. And trust me, the audience loves hearing directly. And wow, what amazing insights just in a matter of about 30, 35 minutes. But my, my question to you, going back to your own experience around clinical trials and data, a lot of times it's not because the data is not there. It's because we're challenged in communicating that effectively and reaching audiences. So kind of going back to when you talk about underserved populations, is are there any unique ways we could reach them so that we're able to communicate this data effectively? So it, it's funny that you mentioned this. So I actually just participated in Banff Scientific Communications Conference. And I, I participated in it because I do a lot in social media and communication. So I was thinking that if these amazing people can communicate science to get people who don't understand science, I need to attend this conference. And one of the things that I really appreciated and that I learned from this, this conference is oftentimes we give people way too much information. We give them too many details. So one of the things that I take away and I challenge you all with is stress the meaning, not the details. There is a time and a place for those details to be shown, but how can you at the first moment, right? It's like looking at a at an iPhone or a Samsung commercial. It's like, oh my gosh, the purple iPhone. <gasps> and then you get them in, right? If we could, if we could take clinical trials and take a, a something from Steve Jobs and how he just used to come on the stage and just say, this is what it is. And then at the end, we're going to give you the details. It's like a commercial. All the fine print is at the bottom. Stress the meaning of why and how this is going to help you. And now we're living in a society where people want to help their communities. So take it from just how it can help you, but how it can help your community. I think that this world, especially the device manufacturers, clinical trials, can really focus on how can we take this data, these details, and stress the meaning and the importance and why we need you to either participate and here's what we've gotten out of it. I'd like to circle back to what Heidi said a couple of minutes ago about if you look at the continuum of clinical trials, the more you insert and engage and enlist the help of patients, 
Patients can play a critical role in the dissemination of information. They can help you prepare, believe it or not, understandable and meaningful summaries of the kinds of results that you've produced. So until and unless you enlist individuals who walk the walk and talk the talk in their communities, you're always going to kind of strike out. You've got to engage as co-partners the um, individuals who are part of your research and part of those communities who you're trying to um, engage. We need foot soldiers to carry the message. It's pretty much just what Stephen said. We need communities. We need grassroots organizations. We need to make sure that the people that you're communicating that message to understands the message in order to speak the language that their community that they serve understand. So definitely agree with Stephen. Foot soldiers definitely need it. Well, and and I just want to you know, having now participated on a couple of different you know from beginning to end with researchers to you know come up with study concept and then the the you know, you're writing the the proposal in order to get your grant so you can then you know do the study and it always starts out with the right intentions and then it's like oh well we have to get the the RIB or the you know involved and it turns into just a bunch of gobbledygook language for you know CYA and it loses you know, by the time they've written it for the um, meeting all of the compliance, it no longer sounds like anything anybody wants to do. And I feel like we need to go back to really look at doing, you know, to Sharice's point, if we want to get people involved in, and stress the the shiny object part of I want to be, I want to be doing that, we have to lose all of the the gobbledygook labeling language that is meaningless to patients, but it it's sort of like in internal industry. And that's where it ends up being focused is internal in industry. So everyone doesn't get in trouble or whatever, but it's meaningless for us as patients. Got it. Thanks. I know, I mean, in the times of COVID, you can't have a panel and not talk about the pandemic, right? And I know we touched on, on aspects of it through the conversation. So maybe, Stephen, the last question to you. Um, how has the pandemic changed your engagement with providers and the healthcare delivery system? Um, well, as, as Heidi indicated, it levels the playing field. I was really... I've been traumatized for over 50 years by going into clinics, offices, and hospitals. And so when I can communicate to my physician through the comfort of my office or my home, I feel much more in my element and I'm not reminded of losing some of my identity every time someone puts a wristband on my arm to let me know you're not in your own world anymore, Steve. You're in our world. And so to me, I feel much more comfortable, conversational. Again, I miss the fact that nothing, nothing replaces having my critical care physician listening to my lungs. I haven't had anyone listen to my lungs in over a year. That makes me a bit nervous. So there's nothing to replace the value of that hands-on experience. However, we can, through your innovations, um, develop ways to be able to have that kind of data reach uh, my physician. And that's the great promise. We're not just stuck in a world anymore that we just have to limp along. But all of these people involved in this conference are brilliant. They're innovators and they care about us and we care about you. You have to understand that. We're not trying to be critical of you. We're just asking you to 
partner with us and allow us to help you help others like us. Well, thanks, Steve. I could not think of a better way to wrap this panel up uh, other than that call to action. So, so thanks again, Heidi, Brian, Steve, and Sharice for sharing your insights today and uh, for spending some time with all of us today. Uh, needless to say, it was a pleasure to speak with you about the promise and challenges of uh, some of today's burgeoning digital health solutions. And to everyone listening, I hope this conversation inspired you to think even more carefully about patients, uh, rather about people. Um, as we continue working on new applications of digital technologies to improve the lives of people experiencing disease, let's all stay aware of the potential risks these solutions may carry. Um, it's always worth it to take a people-centric or a patient-centric approach first. So thanks again, and uh, I hope you all stay safe and healthy, and hopefully we get to see each other in person really soon.